Thank you, Nilfar, and uh, to my fellow uh, panelists, it's a great honor and privilege to be here today. In 1980, I came for the very first time to Northern Ireland by bicycle. I uh, decided in my home in Minnesota that there was something drawing me to Northern Ireland. It's a long story, but I bicycled my way up the, the west coast into uh, Derry, where the war was quite visible, and then all the way up around the north coast to a little community called Cornilla where I began really to learn how early hatred is taught. And that was really the lesson of that summer, that children quite young had learned the narrative, the stories of the violence that was still in full form here in Northern Ireland. So from there, my life went on to be an anthropologist, and so my remarks today really represent my study of societies in transition. I do work for a quasi-governmental organization uh, founded by the U.S. Congress to uh, help end violence. But my remarks today are very much my own. So I like to think, as an anthropologist, that nothing changes a society faster than war. Not only does it affect the economical and political landscape, but it also shapes and reshapes the roles of men and women during and after the conflict. Yet we rarely use this opening of change to leverage for more gender equal societies. And so you'll see my argument here over the next few minutes is how to be more conscious about that opportunity of change uh, and to build that uh, element from the beginning into our world. Research has really begun to shed light on this nexus. The Women's Stats Project out of Texas A&M for example, has established a correlation between a country's gender equality and its relative level of peacefulness. In other words, the more violent your country is, or a country for that matter, probably the less gender equality. So as we've seen in the case throughout the Arab Spring countries, with perhaps the exception of Tunisia, we know that during social upheaval, societies often constrict gender roles, and these gender roles become less equal. So I'd like to suggest that reframing the notion of gender in the peace and security sectors must be actually about both men and women, and about carving out new identities for sustainable peace. Up until recently, we only saw conflict through the eyes of men. As one of my colleagues and friends, Abigail Disney, says, it as if the camera was mounted on John Wayne's pit helmet, and it focused only on the violence. That is how we came to see and understand more. But about 16 years ago, next month, the United Nations Security Council actually passed a resolution, and this is the Security Council, not the General Assembly, to begin adding an understanding for the respect of roles and experience of women in war, and not just men. Come to have been known, and you probably know it as Resolution 1325, it recognizes that women should not only be given special protections during war, but that they must play an integral and important active role in building sustainable peace. And though 1325 has brought a more holistic understanding of the impacts of war, women remain notably absent when peace treaties are being shaped and signed. And so when I hear that gender equality questions will be addressed once peace is finally achieved, I will tell you that such a peace treaty will fall short, if not ultimately fail. 
how about rewriting gender equality into peace and security institutions is going to take many, many years, maybe a generation or more. However, I do see incremental progress. Globally, we have finally begun to take seriously that women, and also men, are often victims of wartime sexual violence. No longer do policymakers or military generals alike brush off rape as some sort of entitlement of the victors of war. Instead, we recognize it more as a devastating crime against humanity that should not be tolerated and must be prosecuted. Another important shift in how we imagine gender in war and in peace is that we're recognizing that gender is actually <coughs> not another name for women, but that men are also gendered beings. At my institution, we are really looking at the study of the impact of all this women's programming. And we looked at it especially in Iraq and in Afghanistan where we have offices. And one of the most consistent recommendations for ensuring a sustainable and supportive programs for women is to make sure men are engaged. Men need to be a part of the change on gender equality and cannot be kept in a separate silo. We especially must engage men in helping to solve the global epidemic of gender-based violence. Although it is accurate that much of the violence around the world is committed by men. Nevertheless, it is actually very few men who commit violence compared to the many who just remain silent about the violence. I'm encouraged by the research of neurobiologists like Deborah, Dr. Deborah Niehoff. She wrote the book, The Biology of Violence, and she suggests ultimately violence is not hardwired into our male species. Think about that as a framework. We do accept that as just an assumption in almost all things we do. Her work is at the cutting edge of helping us rewrite our own social narratives that men are, by nature, violent. Science is helping us understand how early we learn and reinforce violence in boys as a part of their male identity. Indeed, if violence isn't hardwired, and if as researchers have found, sexual violence in war is neither inevitable nor ubiquitous, possibly it leads really open up for society to solve human problems without resorting to violence. In societies where the culture of violence has become the norm for so solving social issues, the UN sexual, a Special Representative on Sexual Violence, Zena Bangura, explains that it's not enough at the end of the war to take the guns out of the hands of young men, but to take the guns out of their minds. In Afghanistan, we're working with uh, local partners uh, who are committed to help engaging men about ending violence through an effort to actually reshape the concept of creating peaceful narratives about man manhood. Now, as an anthropologist, somebody who has studied a lot of rites of passage, I really believe that when violence becomes a part of the social fabric or formula for creating an adult man, then fusion of violence and manhood go together. And how do we learn other narratives about peaceful manhood, about caregiving male, and about a way to understand how to provide alternative I think this is another <coughs> approach to gender equality. We often so focus on women, we forget the essential part of men in our gender dynamics. 
So given that war is a violent social process that attempts to solve problems, not very effectively or efficiently, as we all know sitting in this room, we know it also changes every facet of how societies organize. Thus, peace treaties offer a critical potential to integrate gender equality norms into a new, a new social framework. And that can only occur when both men and women are creating and securing the peace together. I think this is the way forward in the 21st century that sustainable peace is a whole of society effort where gender equality and gender identities is reached and sustained, that peace will follow. And so I just wanted to end with a framework that I have been uh, working on over the last years. Uh, I work now with policymakers a lot, and as an anthropologist, you know, they're as strange of a culture as any we can imagine. And learning how to speak their language and bring new frameworks to policymakers so that their legislation <coughs> and the funding that they associate with that legislation has an open framework has really been one of the biggest challenges of my career. And I love it. So here's the framework I've been working on. And I love your feedback. It's still in formation. But if you will, I'm going to just stand for a second. Um, so I, I argue for policymakers that really most everything we do is without an awareness about gender. It's, it's, uh, it's just who we are. We don't even challenge the assumptions that are behind how we think the world is organized. As an anthropologist, I acknowledge that there is biology associated with being born male or female. But by the way, we are up until the 22nd chromosome, we are without gender. It is only at the 23rd chromosome that gender is determined. So it's a very last thought in the formation of a human being. We often also think about gender neutral, that the impacts of anything is the same for men and women. We create many, many policies assuming that. And I would say that especially in development, where I spent a lot of my years, so it is a way, I'm, I, I'm trying to say that there's really not a judgment here, it's just a recognition of the various ways we look at gender. I mentioned 16 years ago we introduced this concept of women, peace, and security. That was a breakthrough concept. I also argue that in perhaps it created a silo where women are more thought of as victims and not as empowered countries. Uh, contributors to society. And so we've been working on the other side of the coin, men, peace, and security, because men and women are both in this gender social contract. And we know to make change happen, it takes both men and women to rewrite that contract. And so I spend a lot of time talking about the gender relational, because we know that Gender is not the same thing as sex identities, male or female. That gender is uh, an institutional perspective. It is a group perspective. It is peer generated. It is re repeated by media. It is all in there, the messages, the expectations, and ideas about who we are. Also, I like to say, it doesn't matter which door you enter for the, this gender framework, because they all lead to a more open perspective on gender <coughs> equality. And so I'd like to just end with two of my favorite people who inspire me every day. And one is Martin Luther King Jr. And I love this quote, those who love peace must learn to organize as effectively as love those who love war. It's important because to love peace means we have to be open to new frameworks and understanding how to organize the world that is open for all of us. And Eleanor Roosevelt, 
It isn't enough to talk about peace, one must believe in it, and it isn't enough to believe in it, one must work at it. And I think we're all doing that here at this conference. And finally, I'd like to invite you on September 21st, the International Day of Peace, to take a challenge to commit yourself uh, to a day of peace, or a week of peace, or a year of peace. And uh, you can take that challenge if you'd like through Twitter, hashtag Peace Day Challenge. But it is uh, an effort that the Institute of Peace is working on to bring as much knowledge and understanding about peace as there is about war. So thank you very much.